Alright, we're rolling. Hi, future Andy. Hi. <laughs> All right. Uh, all right. So, what do you know about gas so far? Did you read any documentation on it at all, or? Uh, I had a pretty good con, like sort of a basic understanding of like the ability, um, what it kind of will do at, at, at a high level. But if you want to, you know, go over it all right. again, like yeah, yeah, uh, like I'm five. Okay, so that that's good. Uh, so let me let me get out old notepad. I'm surprised it's because it seems like it does track some it does sort of do debuff and buff too, which is kind of weird. Hang on. I can't decide to get like super aggressive on the cuddles and attention. All right. So, uh, yeah, no, it's it's great for buffs and things like that. I'll, I'll show you what I mean. So first at the at the core of the ability system is the ability system component. All right. So that that is the brains of everything. Everything goes through that component. Mm -hmm. It handles it handles gameplay effects, game routing gameplay tags, running the abilities, that sort of thing, doing replication, all that stuff. It's all being handled in that component. Okay. Yep. All right. Then we got gameplay abilities mm -hmm. or abilities for short. We got gameplay effects. Gameplay cues. Uh, well, actually, hang on. Let me let me do this. Uh, gameplay tags, mm -hmm. and then gameplay cues, which you which is just like a specialized gameplay tag. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but it, it kind of works in tandem. Is so. It, is tag the parent for cues? Is it uh, no. It well, no. It, they just do a parent. They do the base tag hierarchy of gameplay cube dot, and then whatever you're trying to do with that. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So, all right. So we have those. Those, those are literally all of the like super important. Oh wait, and one more thing. Uh. Uh, gameplay attributes. Oh okay. All right. Um. Okay. So. So we have the understanding of this. It, it handles RPCs, spawning. Uh, abilities. Um. And when I say abilities, I mean literally gameplay abilities, not mm -hmm. like, you know, some actor in the world kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That's not his job. The ability can handle that, but not not the not the component itself. Um, replication, uh, tracking of gameplay effects, uh, attributes, tags, and abilities. So that it does a lot, okay? That component's like super powerful, and even then, everyone always ends up like overriding stuff and adding their own things to it. Um, it does not. I'm gonna specify this is very important. Does not uh, run on fixed network tick, but it does have prediction and rollbacks kind of capabilities all right uh in what scenario are you going to end up with fixed network tech like uh sir like you, uh, like a dedicated server like no it's in any networking environment you would want a fixed tick so like here's an example um i do something on let me let me type it out here so i can explain it better so step one i jump okay on client mm -hmm. okay client jumps all right uh, then the client will send an RPC to the server saying jump. Okay. Okay. All right. That's, it's really sending the input for the jump, not even the actual jump function. It's just sending the input. Uh, so jump input. Okay. Uh, the server receives jump input and does jump. Okay. Now here's an important part. What happens if at this point, or at this point, wait, uh, and I, I can't figure out how to type stuff. Uh, at this point, uh, client dodges. You know, does the dodge button and stuff in the air. So now they're dodging at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the server needs to do that as well. So it then needs to be like, okay, uh, client server dodge 
input. All right. So right now we have a dependency thing of like, hey, we never actually confirmed the jump yet. The server still hasn't received the jump input kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so when the server receives it, it's going to go, okay, I'm going to jump. So server jump. All right. And then I'm, I'm, just for time, uh, uh, send it to the client, jump confirmed. OK. This is a very simple explanation, by the way. Yeah, so yeah. what if another player pushes them in the air? OK. So mm -hmm. other player on the server pushes that player in the air. OK. Then server receives dodge input. OK, so now the server's way off because he just got pushed out of the way in the air. Right. And then gets the dodge input. He's going to dodge even further away. So this is where rollback comes in. And it's like, OK, the frame number, the frame ordering of everything, like there's a specific order that needed to happen. The client's going to have to roll back to that specific frame order and stuff, which the game playability system does not have. It does not have a fixed tick order. It just oh, basically okay. operates on who comes in first. Oh, okay. Yeah. It, it does have some ordering in terms of, like, dependencies and stuff like that with something called a prediction key, which is in C++ only. But mm -hmm. even then, it kind of, like, it'll handle it for you kind of thing, which so you won't have you, to worry about. Hmm? So if you want some, something more specific, you can have to write your own then. Yeah, exactly. To, to do so like, the rollback. Yeah. Okay. So like, yeah, and then at this point, like, this is highlighting the main problem that needs to have a rollback happen for the client. All right, the server does not need to rollback. I see. All right, because that's server authoritative. The serve. What happens on the server is the source of truth, not the client. The client right. should have gotten the jump confirm confirmation. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, and then he receives after that a rollback uh, message saying, "Hey, you need. You can't dodge." Because you got pushed, so you're getting pushed now, and then dot, and then you can try to dodge if you want. But mm -hmm. we're neutering everything that happened, you know, in between the confirmation, so or deleting that history basically. Um, so anyway, that's a general quick overview of server rollback stuff. So I'm going to move this out that of the way. That has huge implication on latency then. So yeah. it it does and it doesn't. Okay. Because. <laughs> That that now you're now you're starting to realize like what everyone's always focusing on. So there's a lot of CPU time that gets used up just yeah. doing these rollbacks and stuff. But you can do this all in a single frame, basically. Okay. It's it's how you order and buffer things and sort of stuff. Like I'm just giving you a very bare bones quick example of like where the ability system can possibly fail. Oh. Okay. All right. And that's for networked environments. Uh, in single player, you don't have to worry about that. Because it's single player, no yeah. network. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, you had a server. So I just want, yeah, I just want to let you know, okay. it does have prediction. Does have prediction. Okay. Okay. It just doesn't have rollback. All right. It does have a sort of rollback where it's like, hey, if the prediction gets rejected, because they do have to confirm a prediction. If the prediction gets rejected, then you have to manually put in like what happens when it gets canceled, basically. And that's that's what that's what you would consider as the rollback. I see. Um, so rollback as in undo what you just did. Sure. So, and gameplay effects already have that support, which you're good, which should be happy. With. <laughs> um, okay. So, abilities. These guys are like instanced logic objects. Okay, they are objects. But usually they're not in, in they're not directly replicated in networked environments, but they do um, they do basically instance on the client, instance on on the owning client only, and then they run you know ability logic and that kind of thing. All right? Uh, they're they're basically their job is you know the functionality of an ability do this so. Uh, the logic of gameplay. Oh, so literally mm. things like spawning bullets while it's happening. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Their their job is to actually spawn the bullets, track if they hit anything, and then 
what should happen when they hit something. Oh, okay, okay. great. Yeah, so yeah. basically it's an object that handles any runtime gameplay related. Yeah, and oh. they're modular. So oh, like, they're, they're literally just like in- objects. Right, so then, okay. then we get into gameplay effects. This is probably the thing that is the most actually important part. Everyone kind of focuses on the abilities, but the gameplay effects no one really wants to talk about or explain because it's so monolithic and it's so important at the same time. So these are data objects that um, they're they're basically so they they're data objects that you do not change at runtime. Like that's that's the goal. That's the yep. whole thing. They're mm-hmm. just data, yep. all right? They're configurations of how you modify other data. Um, let me write that. Configurations yeah. of how you modify gameplay data. Okay. Yep. Um, at runtime, when you use them and apply them, they're basically thrown into what's called gameplay effect specs. All right, and specs are basically like instances in quotes, or instance containers to like track what's going on. So that way, you're not actually instancing a new object; you're just basically pointing to the the source of truth and then modifying what you need to. Okay. And that's it. All right. Okay. So, yeah, I'm that I'm gonna write that as another op. Another thing is. Um, uh, specs are instances to track objects and source data. Uh, that sounds, that's a pretty like uh, straightforward way to build an ability system, right? Like you have the things that you yeah. can cast and then the data that it reads from. So mm-hmm. yeah, it, exactly. It manipulates the things that you're doing or the things that's happening. Yeah. Okay. The data exactly. manipulates the thing. Okay. Great. Yeah. Uh, they have gameplay ability specs. They also have effect specs. Um, an important aspect is you can also feed data into the spec to, you know, like have it drive modifications at runtime. So it's like, say, you want to modify this value. Uh, well, I want to change it depending on, you know, which actor it is. So they would feed in their value into the spec, and that spec gets resolved out uh, through the data orientation of everything. Okay. So it's very data driven, very data oriented in how it's set up. Um, allows you to input runtime data to Lego connect to the data point. Sorry, it's going to be a lot of contextual stuff. So. Like, there's nothing explicitly saying data, really, or there may be, but it's kind of like you have to contextually understand these things. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay, so attributes. These are straight up uh, numeric properties. Okay? Yep. Uh, They're placed in an attribute set, so that's another thing. Attribute set, a list of gameplay attributes. Handles... uh, Holds them. Oh wait. Uh, handles. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how to say this. Replicate. No, it it handles with replication. It's in in correlation to that. Mm-hmm. So it would. Uh, the game the ability system component would talk to these attribute sets to handle the replication. So they're basically like replication wrap for gameplay attributes. Now, here's a here's a crappy thing about attributes that I don't like, and they are well, Epic is well aware, and they're trying to fix that. Only make these in the SQL plus. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, same with attribute sets. Um, but you can once you've made them in C plus plus, you can use them in Blueprint and stuff like that. It's just you can't declare them, can or you, you know, make them. A... Can you do a hmm? generic one and then inherit from them? No, you can't, because they're Ooh. they're actually structs. Oh, oh, oh! So you literally yeah. got to write it in. Yeah. Yourself. Okay. Yeah, it, it's something they're they're well aware of, and I've gave I've given them some notes on suggestions for it on what they could do to change that. Uh, one of them was making them hierarchical U object types that they're in a definition list and things like that, which is the attribute set. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, even then they they gotta they gotta fix their stuff. Hopefully they they'll fix it, but you know, <laughs> up to them. 
We anyway, never know if this uh, video goes viral. No. Uh, the the gameplay the gameplay effects stuff they recently like did a huge refactor of them so they're modular. Mm -hmm. They used to be giant monolithic data list of like just a bunch of things you want to configure, and it was like an overload of every designer. Like I hate dealing with gameplay effects because I have all these different drop downs, and it would reorganize it every time. So oh, like you yeah. never had the same order of of the categories in the list. <laughs> so it'd be like, okay, I'm opening up this one. Where's where's the modifiers? Okay, where's the duration? It's at the top, it's at the bottom, it's in the middle. Where is it? <laughs> it, it was terrible. Um, so they've they've kind of cleaned it up and made it a lot easier to digest. Uh, gameplay tags, you know what gameplay tags are. Higher article uh, strings. That's it. And then gameplay cues, gameplay tags, prefixed with gameplay cue dot. And that's it. Uh, oh yeah, so these ones are interesting. So gameplay cues are visuals. They're, they're literally intended to be the representation of only visuals. They can't really have gameplay logic and they don't talk to gameplay systems. Okay, so it's like uh, particle effects or animations that aren't contingent for gameplay you know it goes one way yeah yeah i mean you can you can put it in an an animation montage for an anim notify but it's kind of that thing of like hey you have to be aware of like what's going on um so right it's yeah really uh, just downstream effect from an ability yeah yeah um so kind of yeah so the the gameplay cues everyone kind of ends up rolling their own solution for them anyway and not using them um, on projects I've worked on, there have been times where we looked at them and go, no, we're going to do our own thing, and never touch gameplay cues. Uh, okay. Or we, we use them, but like in a way that's not the way they intended. <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of that thing of like, gameplay cues are fine for a very simple what you're doing kind of situation box product. Uh, probably for your game it would be good. Um, but for like games that are like live service or something like that, it kind of doesn't doesn't scale it's weird uh so um yeah i'd, ima I'd yeah. imagine for a live service you really want to then like modularize it and yeah uh, so like a lot of variants too so yeah i mean it's good for simple stuff i'll say that um right. it has pooling functionality oh nice or performance um it also uh so you can only have one one gameplay cue tied to a single actor or object or handler, basically. So a gameplay cue handler can be an actor or an object that's meant to handle spawning stuff. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, but they can be instanced. Uh, there's an there's an option to do things on the class default object. I don't recommend that even. Even people at Epic who have worked on Gas and like helped build it say that may using that was a mistake and making that exposed was a mistake because it has only caused problems every time I've tried to use it. Uh, so don't use don't use that. All right. Um, uh, oh yeah. Uh, handlers can only be tied to a single gameplay queue. Okay. And we will go over that later, so I'm going to minimize this. All right, so in this uh, gas documentation project, I'm going to hit play. All right, here I am. Got, I'm shooting. Does damage to this guy. Um, I can damage myself. These are all using gameplay effects, essentially, and abilities. Mm -hmm. And I can heal myself. There we go. And I can damage these guys. Uh, wh which one? The passively generating armor stacks. Uh, dash, so I can dash. Only forward, apparently, and R for meteor. That's just a, a giant box. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. Oop. And it has a little cooldown time, as you can see. And... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's got a little knocked out symbol. Okay. So, uh... Let's go into what it looks like on the characters, the hero, and let's look at his blueprint. So you can see his character. So he's got nothing going on here. All right. Oh, come on. Come on. 
Come on, game. This is not difficult. This is not difficult to load stuff. All right, so it has no ability system component, as you can see. It just has a floating status bar component. Yep. Yep, which is just a widget component. Was that built in? Right. Oh. Uh, no, they added it. Okay. They have their own C++ class. All right, yeah. so you may be wondering, where is that ability system component? So ability system has the, the ability system has this context of owner and avatar okay the avatar or the owner is the actor with the ability system component on it uh by the way this uh ability system component just for shorthand asc that's this that's the okay the nickname for it just to speed it up and uh, gameplay effects, we will call them GEs. Okay. And, you know, abilities are abilities, but some you'll prefix them with uh, GA, usually. Um, so avatar. Avatar is the representation in the world, like the character in this case. So the actor representation using the ASC. Usually connected to the owner in some way okay and we have another concept I'm going to tell you about in a second which is called uh, source slot and source and target source is the owner ability ASC whoops ASC and then target the target or the the person the actor receiving uh it's it's so both of these are ASCs uh, ability system components um the receiving uh ASC for gameplay effects damage etc okay um the owner ASC that is causing Gameplay, effects, damage, etc., um, can also be causing outgoing and or incoming. Okay. okay. Yep. These are very important words right here. Outgoing. I'm gonna capitalize that actually. Yep. Going and incoming. Okay. I'm gonna do this as well. Receiving. Pausing, okay, because in the in the system it'll use those kind of names and words, and it's like, okay, which one are they talking about? They're talking about source. They're talking about target. Mm -hmm. Okay, so follow me so far. Any questions so far before we move forward? Just you know, it's very typical of how you would write an ability system. Okay, great. Yeah. So uh, in this project, and this is usually how it gets done in some projects and most projects. The owner tends to be the player state. So the player state will usually have the ability system component. And the avatar is the character. So if we go to here, blueprints maybe, uh, player controller, player state. There he is, ability system component. Right there. Okay. So, yeah. And... Uh, Let's go to hero. No, minions. Let's let's see the red minions blueprint. Okay. You can actually put an ability system component on the minion himself and make him the owner and the avatar at the same time. So that's another thing. The source, target, owner, avatar, they can all be their same actor. So they can all. So if I'm the owner, I can also be the avatar in cases. I can also be the source and the target. Because I'm, I could be applying a gameplay effect to myself or something like that. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, I just want to make that clear. There's cases where people are like, okay, it always has to be two different actors. Like, nope. You can do whatever you want with it. You know, it will handle it. So, all right. Um. Yeah, and he named it Hard Ref Ability System. So it uses these uh, interfaces. Whoops, wrong one. Um. Inherited interface, the ability system interface. So, get ability system component. So this, what it does is it checks for 
that interface on the actor that's being, being fed in, in this case, self. And then it tries to use the interface to find that ability system component. And if it fails to use the interface, it's going to then just do, OK, search through the components and find an ability system component in that case. The interface is faster, but the component search is like the fallback option. Okay. So that way, it, you don't need the interface on an actor if it has the component on there. But the interface is good to have. It okay. should, it's always faster, right? Interface. Yes. Like because it goes it directly routes yeah it it has a function directly on it saying get ability system component which they override and they feed it in and then it's like okay well i'm just going to use that function rather than just like okay one two three four there it is okay so and if we go to this guy he has the interface as well so so here's another thing uh ability system interface oh yeah that's right so Usually when they do the ability system component interface, they will also do like an interface for gameplay tags. So uh, get owned, get gameplay tags. Interesting. Oh, wait, do I have the, no, this is, this is on this project. It should have that. Um, I guess they cut that out. But usually there is a, uh, let me go to plugins, gameplay tag yeah no it's it's an angle i don't know why it's not showing up but um usually they'll do a thing of like okay uh get gameplay tags yeah it's like get own gameplay tags and this is an interface that would be on the actor as well so like you would have the ability system interface and this tag interface and it would just literally get the own tags from the ability system component through the interface so Okay. That's that's something is like an optional thing that would just kind of helps people out and saves them time doing stuff because then you can just do get actor get tags and it routes it up all the way through to the ASC. So there's that. Uh, any questions so far? No, pretty straightforward. Okay, so I'm gonna jump into C++ land and I'm gonna show you uh, how you set up a gameplay attribute. I also opened up some files already just to show some stuff preemptively, but uh, that's not related to the to what I'm talking about yet. Um, characters, I think it's in abilities. No, um, minions, no. Attribute sets, there it is. All right, so here we have uh, an attribute set base. It inherits from attribute set. This is a macro. That's just for shorthand. You can make one yourself. Um, but it basically uses some stuff that Gas already set up for getting these attributes. What they literally do uh, for getting these attributes, if anyone is curious, you basically just... They're, they're basically searching through the actual U property stuff through, through reflection and finding it by name. <laughs> so, Ooh. yeah. So that's what you're doing when you use these attribute accessors. Ooh. It's not it's not really too bad because they've optimized it a ton, mm -hmm. but that's actually what they're doing. So like you can even go and look at what they're doing. This is, some of this is literally like, you know, get it from an ability system component. Yeah, um, they, they're raw dogging it. Yeah, here it is. Get attribute. <laughs> this is so the reason why they're doing it this way is because the attribute oh. itself is not the actual like thing with the float values and things like that. It's a wrapper for um, the gameplay attribute is actually a wrapper for this this attribute data. So this is not the gameplay attribute that you would use. Um, what you would actually use is something like oh, one second. Uh, let me do get health attribute. All right. All right. Uh, actually, let me just do F gameplay attribute so this is the actual type you would get whoops all right like, like that actually represents the attribute yeah object, the, right this is well so this is the wrapper oh okay uh for that gameplay attribute data or flow property inside the attribute set so this is what would get used in blueprints and things like that oh okay, one, okay. yeah the one you're declaring in c plus plus sorry you can actually inherit from this and then specify it here, and it will work fine because it links up with the gameplay attribute type. 
so this guy is basically just a wrapper pointing to uh, this guy. Does that make sense? Yep. It's a, just okay. really just pointing to one one source, which is where that health is declared. Yeah, exactly. So, and these guys are the ones with the actual numeric data oh. values. So these would get instanced, whereas these guys are or these guys are actually static. These are globally accessible as the type. And then you're going into the ability system component saying, I want your instances of health. Does that make sense? Yeah, in a lot of ways, I wrote I wrote something like this in component form. Right? It's <laughs> like you just have health and then you have the component that provides you something that gets and said health. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so pointing really just to the thing that's health with yeah. different ways of wrapping around it. <laughs> Exactly, and the only the only difference is that Epic made it very nice and easy to use because they just give you a giant list that you can pick from. So I'm going to show you that. Um, so we're going to go to Hero. So you see these GEs; these are gameplay effects. You can use a gameplay effect to add, to override, to subtract, multiply, divide, whatever, um, for the attributes. And usually what we'll have is we'll have a GE just for initializing all their default values. So this is like your data table of like, here's your default values on start. And then everything else just kind of compounds up over time. Um, usually they will also have a min and max value. So, or a current value and a max value. So as you can see here, health, health, max health. And if we go into the C++, um, they they've set up some code in this in this project to be like, hey, uh, I'm going to basically clamp that value to the max value, so that way it never exceeds that max value. Yeah, um, pretty much for any like pool, it is. pool yeah. related a calculation, you clamp the max. Yeah, you get a max and. Yeah, and they're doing that inside the attribute set because that's where the data is anyway. So it's like. Right. Why, let's why do it at the elsewhere. source <laughs> yeah let's yeah. do it at the source before we proclaim it to anyone else to get it so yeah that's a healthy way of protecting the data exactly that way you know where it's being edited yeah and then you can just modify the max value if you want to expand it and make it larger on the length so uh so here we're going to open up the ge so this seems like a lot it used to be much worse dude <laughs> so much worse <laughs> Wait, so you got a bunch of attribute, character levels. Oh, yeah, I mean, those are things that you make them as you go. Yeah, no, no, no. It could it, get worse. No, 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 no. Uh, so this is just modifying attributes. I'm talking about the other stuff the gameplay effects do. So this is the part where 5.3 apparently is when they changed this, so you can jump to 5.3. 5.4 has some rendering stuff that's going to improve your performance a bunch, so that's why I was suggesting that initially. Um, but, so I'm going to... I'm gonna, so these components are new. This is the modular aspect of gameplay effects that just got changed completely. So I'm going to do this. OK. And you can select all the different aspects of like components for like what this gameplay effect can do. Imagine all of these now just expanded out as giant list, and all of them have like a bunch of different properties and attributes to them. Mm. Yeah, that, that's what I and. Imagine all of this was just constantly getting reordered every time you opened one. Because the categories would change. There was no set order. And it's a class default. <laughs> yeah, well... I mean, it was a nightmare. Doing that, imagine doing that for gas, yeah. Where yeah. You, you're constantly updating and pushing things. Hey, can, yeah. can I uh, walk away for a second and get something? Sure. Yeah, I'll be back in a second. Pause the video then. All right, uh, I'm back. All right, welcome back. I'm just trying to find a picture of gameplay effects, honestly. Um, yeah, this is like that stuff I was talking about. Uh, no, that's not it, actually. Um, yeah, they, it, was a, it was a lot of list stuff. Uh, anyway, all right, so here's what an attribute looks like, usually, when you're defining it in the gameplay effect. So you have your attribute, okay, that we're going to modify. 
that's the list, and you can search it out, and it's hierarchical. So, like, it's hierarchical at the sense of the attribute sets. So you can have another attribute set that's specifically for elements or something like that, or, you know, money-related stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the only problem is you can't have duplicate attribute sets or different types on the same ability system component. So you can have one GD attribute set base, and you can have one GD attribute set elements. And if you try to add another elements one, it's going to complain and be like, you can't add two kind of thing. Or they've changed it where it doesn't complain, but it will only find one of them. And it, you have no control of which one it finds. So. Does that make sense? Sort of. I have to see it. Like, yeah. I mean, I've never used it before, so I wouldn't know. Well, so... Uh, let me go back to this. So this attribute set, you can have different... You can have more than one attribute set, basically. Right. You can compartmentalize it to be like one is specific for health one is specific for elemental stuff oh, you know oh, like okay. fire element and then max fire element that kind of thing but you can only have one so you can't have like two different fire or you can't have two different health attribute datas basically which makes sense but it's like if you want to do it as like one is just specifically health and max health and that's it and then you want to had add another one it's like they're gonna conflict yeah you just kind of have to do your own logic to sort it out exactly yeah yeah so it's like you, you end up having to just make multiple attribute sets probably with the same name just like hierarchically handled by the attribute set itself which is kind of dumb in my opinion but yeah all right so here we're we're basically doing the uh, modifier operation, which is an override. You can also set it to invalid. Um, <laughs> this is just for, you know, you haven't set it to anything kind of thing. Uh, you can add, you can multiply, divide. You can also do negative values for adding, obviously. Uh, and then the modifier magnitude. So magnitude is how much you're going to change it. There's, uh, there's two concepts with um, attributes. Um, Okay, so there's a base and a current slash magnitude value. Yep. Okay, the base value is like the source of truth. Like, if you modify this and you removed all of the gameplay effects that are modifying it, it returns to this value. Whereas the current magnitude is, uh, you know, with all the gameplay effects, all the modifications that have been applied, kind of thing. Right. Yeah, that's how you have to do the buff debuff calculation. You need the source of truth to return to when the duration is over. Exactly. Um, a lot of people get those mixed up, and they sometimes will just be like, "Ah, oh, I don't. I'm just going to use base value everywhere." It's like, no, just use current. If you're reading from it, base is if like you need only the source of truth with no modifications, and only modify this if you're actually modifying like an upgrade or something like that. You know, you're getting that. And even then, you could just wrap that as a GE that's modifying the current. <laughs> and then you're good. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, it really, yeah. <laughs> um, you can also set the scalable float uh, magnitude as whatever here. You can also use a curve table. And then it will pull from that curve table and, like, scale based on that. Um, I rarely ever use that, honestly. We end up just using these. That's great <laughs> but it's for uh, fall-offs, you know, like yep projectile yep. you can do it also based on another attribute so and it changes it which is nice uh so then so backing attribute is where you're pay, you're basing it off of another attribute like scaling wise so mm -hmm. it, let's say i wanted to uh change my health okay so i want to change my health uh and i want to add to it okay a value that's say 0.25. So oh, let's let's do a calculator actually. Calculator. All right. So let's say my max health is 100. All right. I'm gonna get this guy out here too, so we can track what's going on. So max 100 and current health is let's say 10. Okay. So. Hey, look. 
my cat's like trying to get my attention. I'm trying to do this. Okay. So the way this backing attribute stuff gets calculated out is basically like, okay, the coefficient, it's going to be multiplied by it. And you can see the algorithm for it right here, actually, if you just highlight it. So the evaluating attribute value according to policy, that's that backing attribute, okay? Uh, plus the pre-multiply additive value, which is this guy, and then multiplied by the coefficient, which is this guy, and then plus, you know, this post multiply. I wish they ordered it, you know, vertically based on what's happening first, because then you can just do this, then that, then that, and it would make sense. But, you know, whatever. Um, so anyway, what's going to happen is 100 times 0 0.25, which, yeah, that's going to be 25. 25, okay. So that's the result. That's going to get added on to... That's going to run the modifier operation mm -hmm. of, you know, 10 plus 25, equaling 35. Okay, let me let me make sure my math is, inc is correct. 10 plus 25. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's basically what this whole, like, operation is doing now, this modifier. Right. That's so that's attribute-based, okay? You can make it even more complicated and deep, and deep and stuff like that, but this is just like the prime example. So, um, so you can also select who you're getting this backing attribute from, which is the source or the target. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so snapshot, whether this attribute can be snapshotted or not. I think that's a terrible description. Snapshot is when this is happening. Right, yeah, like that's a common term in WoW as well, where the, yeah. the, the buff, the, the status is, you, you're taking the current value of what it is rather than calculating off of base value. Yeah, so, well, not even base value, so it could be the case where uh, it's like other gameplay effects are happening at the same time, and they're, well, not at the same time, but like uh, accumulating or aggregating and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. snapshot allows you to go oh, like, right. okay, before everything happens, that value plus this, mm -hmm. this is what it should equal out to kind of thing. So then it, in the case of like the attribute to capture, we're, at, we're actually capturing the max health, not health here. So if max health is currently at 100 and then there's another gameplay effect that changes it, we're snapshotting at 100. Right instead of whatever it was that the other gameplay effect caused it to be. And okay, if we did yeah. if we didn't snapshot it, then it would be okay, what is the accumulated total current value? So let's say the game the other gameplay effect was before this guy. Mm -hmm. He's going to go, okay, uh let's use whatever we currently have. So it could be 250 or something. Yeah. And now it's completely changed. So snapshots very good for like making sure nothing is really going out of sync. So when we say capture, that's what we mean. It's like snapshotting. Mm -hmm. So snapshotting is good for that. Capture is also just the term of like, which one is it we're going to modify or read from kind of thing and use. So. Um, and it, you only do this with attributes and tags, by the way, so. So, all right, attribute curve, that one's pretty simple as well. Like, you know, we want to row from, that sort of thing, inside of the backing attribute kind of stuff. Uh, and then uh, which one current in regards to the attribute that we're modifying. So, um, yeah, uh, the magnitude, base value, or the bonus magnitude. Um, I, frankly, never really use this, so... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, this one you might have to play with, but you'll you'll get some fun results. Um, so the, here's the thing about modifiers that they've changed, because this used to not be the case, where it would just be like, okay, we're going to apply all these, you know, if the gameplay effect applies. They've changed it to be more modif modular, where 
you can have specific modifiers run if a tag filter is, you know, successful. Mm -hmm. So if the source has, say, um, a character tag on it, then that's this modifier will only run kind of thing. Oh, okay. And, yeah, and it's the same case with these guys, too. I think they just kind of duplicated some things. Do so you, it, you it's kind of... using tags a lot? Oh, you use tags everywhere, dude, in gas. I see, like, because... Um, yeah. Yeah, like, I've, sometimes I do put tags on, like, um, models and, like, render components just so, like, I can identify a certain piece, but, like, I, I don't... I, tend not to use a lot of tags Maybe oh dude you're gonna that. love tags it you, you're gonna yeah you will love it because it's very is it just, easy is it really just like keyword that's reserved all throughout a project yeah oh shit and it even has a reference viewer oh you could oh shit yeah <laughs> here let me uh i'm sorry it's like unity's tag has let me down i know i know <laughs> no unreal's uh, is fantastic they okay. they use it in fortnite Great. So yeah, like, I was like, oh man, yeah. like I'm not sure because like I was like, okay, if it's string, someone else has had to keep track of this shit. Yeah, no, it it's all so it's all managed properly. So like, you can modify it inside of the gameplay tags, uh, in the project. It goes in ini files, which is the best part. All right, you have a full list. This is this this whole like UI is new, by the way. So like it used to be just like an inline thing here. They changed it to be its own menu i guess to make it easier to uh modify and stuff oh, okay okay so you can see how it says default tags dot ini you can add a new tag and you can specify the source or you can make a new tag source and it'll be in the path of config slash tags and you can name it whatever and then you have that available as your new source so then it would be like okay Select that or the other one. So you can organize your tags even that way. And it resolves out if there's duplicate tags from a plugin, because you can also tag, you can add tags via plugins the same way too. Um, so you can do like uh, inside of gas documentation. Um, you can do, well, you can basically just do the plugin. And then inside the plugin folder, you do a, a config folder like this. Mm -hmm. And then just literally put your tags I and I in there. And you can even modify it here. So like, oh neat. Yeah, I'm gonna open that up. And that's what it looks like. Very easy. It even has dev comments, so you can add a comment explaining what the tag does, or what it's intended for. So, it's very nice, and it resolves out. So if you have do if you have the same tag hierarchy, it'll just it'll be like, oh, we already found it. We're good. So if you already have like uh, ability skill ability two in one in one plugin and then the project they've already added that it's like great it, it'll be fine don't worry about it so and you can unload tags at runtime if wanted um, this is fairly kind of new stuff that they're doing but um, because of the modular gameplay system but or gameplay features but yeah and it has some fast replication stuff but this one needs to have it like identical. So like you can't be adding tags on one and then not having those same tags on the other, you know, machine kind of thing. Because they go based on an integer at that point. Any questions so far? Nope. Yeah. Um, yeah, import tags from config. You can also specify tags in C++ uh, as native tags. Usually what I'll do with native tags is I will prefix them in the name of it, not in the not in the tag hierarchy, but like in the dev comment saying native tag in parentheses and then the description of it. So that way when they hover over it, they see immediately it says native tag and then whatever it is. Any, so they know. Difference? Uh, they can't remove it from here. So it's oh, like you oh, have okay, to go into okay. C++ to remove it. Ah, I see. Yeah, so it's like if a coder needs it, because you can use it for logic too, that's behind the scenes, not for something designer driven. And I've done that plenty of times where it's like, okay, we need gameplay tags for designers, but we also need this tag system for some core feature that I'm building. So I can declare it in C++ and no one's going to remove it. <laughs> and Lyra has an example of, an example of this. That's uh, It's just a single file called uh, Lyra tags. Let me see if I can open it. Um, 
Myra. Game. Yeah, gameplay tags. Let's open that bad boy up. Uh, code. And that's what it looks like. That That's literally... Oh, okay. Yeah, and then they also have the CPP, and that's it. That's... Defying it's a perfect example. Tag. Everything else below this is just extra stuff. So, like, these are all, this is all you need the namespace and then this. So, yeah. Everything else is just extra stuff that they're doing for Lyra. But that's how you declare a name, a native tag. This is how you declare, define it, and then that's about it. And then. You can even reference these directly in C++. So you can just go like uh, Lyra gameplay tags dot input tag underscore move in the C++ and then you have it directly. So you don't have to do like request tag or something like that. Right. So. Um, you can also do a restricted list. It, it's fun. They're, gameplay tags are great, dude. I highly recommend getting used to them because they will make your life so much more modular, easier, more dynamic. And you can add different tags because they have two types. They have a gameplay tag specifically, or you can have a container, so you can have multiple. And it has like functions in there and stuff for like um, comparing. They also have something called a query. So this is what I'm going to open up next. So this is a gameplay tag query. This is where you can do expressions. <laughs> and you can make new expressions too. <laughs> So uh, any tags match, and then you can do like that, and then, OK, and then there you go. Any effects, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah, it's really nice. So if you want to build the query specifically, I, I, I really enjoy queries. I don't think enough people use them. Um, but gameplay tag containers are fine also. It's just that thing of like, hey, query, queries are pretty cool too. Check, check them out. Come on. Be cool. Be cool, guy. Um, oh, yeah. So back to here. So then we have uh, custom calculation class. We haven't even finished with attributes, by the way. <laughs> so custom calculation class. This one's pretty obvious. You can do a custom calculator. All right. And that will handle. And this will, like, basically feed in coefficient, pre, post, multiply stuff, final lookup curve if you need it for the calculator. Um, yeah, so this one is something you can actually in inherit from and use in Blueprint, if, if needed. Uh, I've primarily done it in C++ and then hierarchically built out a system to then inherit in Blueprint, but it's not the actual calculator, uh, just to kind of automate stuff. Right. Okay, so next, but it, it basically, it routes back to a, a final value that is added, that's doing the modifier operation. So you got to remember that. It's like you're layering calculations. Um, so then we have set by caller. So set by caller is a fun one. So this is the one where you're basically saying, here, I'm, I'm going to add a value, and I'm going to get it, and I need to basically, like, um, it's tied to gameplay tags, so like if I do this, compile. Wait, can I type in here? No, I cannot. No, it's grayed out. I know. It's, use this. To, the name the caller will use to set this magnitude by. Why is it? I'm pretty sure you should be able to set. All right. Either way, I guess. I guess they're using the data tag. Either way, you you tie it to a tag or something like that. We usually just have a set by caller tag, <laughs> and then that's about it. You know generic tag or something mm -hmm. like that, um, just for testing, uh, or just general set by caller. Uh, so the way you would do that is using those gameplay specs I, I talked about earlier. So I'm going to show you an example of that in a minute. I'm just going to open up a hero blueprint guy. Uh, gameplay spec. Uh, gameplay effect spec. Nope, that's not it. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna go we're gonna skip ahead. So we're gonna do um, let's do sprint. Sprint should be simple. Ignore that. Ignore ignore all this. Just focus on the graph. <laughs> uh, gameplay act spec. Okay. 
So remember outgoing? Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Remember that term? Yeah. You, you, That's yeah. source. Yeah. Uh, you. So this is where I'm specifying that GE again. So hero attributes in this case, hero mm -hmm. attributes. Okay. And I can specify a level. This is like a constant throughout gas that you can straight up ignore this or you can use it. You know, it's good if you want to do like actual levels of the characters. So like they get from level one to level 30, it scales up with that kind of thing. Um, or you can just ignore it. I've there have been many projects where we just straight up ignore the level. Wait, that's uh, baked in. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Uh, why? Why? Why won't they just open it up to like an attribute, just like modifier, and just fucking let you? Have what do you mean? Wow, well, I'm surprised they just baked it in. Yeah. It. Like, yeah. It, how much I mean, this was they trying to make it. They baked it. Wow. <laughs> I know. Yeah. It was. It was somewhere they made this for uh, Paragon. So. Oh, okay. Kind of I see. That, yeah, that has a ties yeah. with the hero levels. Yeah. Yeah, gas was made for Paragon, and then they retrofitted it into Fortnite, uh, and then okay. it became the behemoth that it is. Holy so, crap. Yeah. So, as you can see, gameplay effects spec handle. So the handle is actually pointing to the real spec. Um, if you noticed my conversation with Davey in, in Discord the other day, I was saying about how there's a bug with this. You don't have to worry about that with Blueprint or whatever you're doing. This was like me going into the lowest levels of gas and doing stuff that I'm pretty sure no one expected. <laughs> but it is part of the system that it should have supported kind of thing. So you're probably going to get an optimization out of out of what I suggested to them. Um, or probably they'll fix it either way. It, the UDN post is there. Um, either way, for those, uh, if you're sharing this video to someone, uh, this can cause a crash if you do use this improperly. If you're using it fine, like, you know, by default stuff, you're fine. Don't worry about it. So this way is fine, by the way, the way I'm doing it. So effect spec allows you to do fun things with it. So in here, I'm just showing you the list. You can add asset tags. Okay. So you can add, you're basically feeding in additional data for it. Oh, so you okay. can do like... Nice. Yeah, this is like your this is like you instancing GE hero attributes and then feeding additional stuff. So you can do an effect context. Um, let me see, where is it? Yeah, assign set by caller magnitude, uh, tag. Yeah, set by caller. Yeah, so you can do these two things. Um, so basically, yeah, you can set the tag and the magnitude honestly. Because you can't specify it in here, it's like, why why have this available? This is really for C++ at that point, um, which is really weird. Yeah, or Blueprint, but you can't change it here. <laughs> uh, anyway, so you, you specify your tag, and then it sets that magnitude, and then it's set for this guy. So when health is going to do an add, it's going to pull that value from set by caller on the spec. Does that make sense? Andy? Hey, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, what else? Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. So basically, this is what you would actually do, like applying to a target or to the owner. See, again, the, the naming uh, for owner and target, source mm -hmm. and causer, you know? <laughs> and you can feed in target data. So target data is basically like your explanation of what you're targeting so target data can be an actor it can be an array of actors it can you know uh target data it can be a filtered list it, you know whatever nice. you can inherit this you can only make new target data types in c++ by the way so oh this right. is basically okay. you yeah so like you can you can still use these in blueprint totally fine just be aware like hey it might end up where like you need to make a new one for something or whatever, uh, like hit result or not hit result, but uh, uh, locations. Yeah. So locations is an interesting one. I'm going to call this one out. All right. So you have a source location. This is like you feeding in extra data. So I'm going to make one of these. You can totally do this. Uh, they're the same struct. So nor the other code there. We're, we're, we'll look at that later. Um, 
So this location type, if you're dealing with a networked environment, it's only going to replicate one of these three. So if it's little transform, you're going to use this one only, and the other data won't replicate. It's for an optimization, but I've been on projects where we need like all of that data to pass through, so we end up making our own version that's literally just don't have a type, just feed in the data and then spit it across the network kind of thing. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. The same with the actor transform. It'll use the source and the component, and uh, socket transform, same case, but it needs a socket now on the component and source ability if you want to. Uh, so just be aware of that. But if you're in single player, all this data is going to share across, so you're fine. Just be aware of that if you go into a new project and you want to add multiplayer or if you want to update it with that, this will probably cause some like headache issues and going like, why isn't it replicating? It's because it's like one of these is getting replicated, not the whole thing. <laughs> so. It's a, it's a weird caveat that they don't tell you. Um, you can also append different target data. So target data has a handle, okay? It says right there, target data handle. All right, the way you get stuff in there is, and we'll deal with context in a minute. You can get actors from it. You can do all this stuff. You can also get other types that you've made out of it. Uh, you just have to expose it to blueprint, blueprint. This is all just stuff Epic made for us beforehand to save time. Uh, so basically, it operates on this. It has, it has two lists. Okay, so the it has an internal list of just one target datas. Okay, and then list, and then it goes into each element and go like, okay, uh, actor array, uh, location info. Like, each one has their own specification of how they get uh, their target data, essentially. So I could do, like, get target data endpoint. All of them are going to say index. So get, yeah, see? So they're basically going, OK, the list is actually just uh, target datas, these handles. And they're going inside and going, OK, which one in that list is it you want? So if you did, like, using this append, you could be like, OK, um, you know, I can do like, let me just make one just as an example. So I'm going to do this and then, um, and then from there, I'm going to append, which is really just doing the add function, like an array. Uh, and then you're doing get actor. Yeah. So now it, now I flipped it where it's, uh, This guy is, yeah. So the the location stuff is the index one, and then uh, index zero is this guy, and then index one is this guy, basically. Does that make sense? OK, so you, you're basically just kind of on the fly assigning like who, who to include. Exactly. OK. And then when you do this apply, gameplay effects spec to it, it's going to go through all of these and go, OK, give me all the actors. Give me all the actors. Give me all the actors so I can get the ability system component to apply this guy to it. Right, right. Yeah. So I just want to let you know about that. And if it fails, it'll just skip over it. It literally is just being like, give me actors. I got nothing. OK, skip. Next move. Move on to the next in index. That kind of thing. OK. So yeah. So anyway, uh, back to context. So they also have this uh, idea of context. And I'm sure you know about this, but basically uh, context allows you to be like, all right, give me who is the causer? Who's the instigator? Uh, where's the origin? Who is the origin? Who's the source object? That kind of stuff. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah, it's just additional context information. That, that you can you can do your own filtering and logic. On exactly. Own. Yeah. yeah. But if you remember when it was asking about source and target, that's actually how you specified is that context struct. Struct. You go here's the causer as my source, and then mm -hmm. who is the target? You know. Right. The target is really you don't have to worry about that because it's going to be the apply. Um, so the target is whoever this is getting applied to. So mm -hmm. target in this case is owner. Um, 
or the target here, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, if we want to do context strikes over here, um, let's say I want to do set origin. Okay, I guess they don't allow that in Blueprint. Um, interesting. I guess they, yeah. All right, but you can add a hit result as well. That's nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, let me see if make effect context. Make context. No, I guess not. But you, I know you can make your own custom stuff for it. So just be aware of that. Um, but that's in C++ as well. If you see something with a spec handle or anything like that, or a handle in the name, that means you can only do this overriding stuff in C++ because of how Blueprint is set up. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because you're basically inheriting from it as a struct in Blueprint, or in C++, and then exposing it to Blueprint. It's kind of weird and annoying, but yeah. Um, okay. But yeah, these specs are really handy. So, spec. So then you can also do... Uh, an ability spec. <laughs> so ability specs are the same thing, but just for gameplay abilities. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Uh, so since we're in an ability, because we're going to now move on to gameplay effects, I feel like I've dragged that out enough. Um, I suggest looking into all of the components available to you, because you can also make your own components. Uh, they also have a fun thing of you can grant. Um, and... Uh, oh, yeah, there's another thing with gameplay effects. Sorry. So there's duration policies of, of three different types, instant, mm -hmm. infinite, and has duration. Right. Um, let's do it. has duration. So has duration or, or infinite have the option of periods, and periods are repeating kind of thing. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, basically, they basically uh, MP5. Yeah, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. So some components will execute only when this is initially applied. So like when I add this to the stack of gameplay effects that are active, um, the modifiers happen every time. All right, with that period, mm -hmm. uh, and then duration, you know, follows that same scalable floats structure kind of thing, um, which is really nice. I'm gonna change it to infinite just to make it more easier to read. Uh, so then, uh, executions. I forget execution class. Oh yeah, so. Executions are kind of like how to affect, you know, the target kind of stuff. Uh, whether they should do like their own custom calculation or whatever. Honestly, I never mess with them half the time because I just use modifiers. Um, but they are available to you. Um, I think you're you're able to uh, inherit them from in Blueprint, um, or you can use them in C++, obviously. But in Blueprint, I think they are supported. Uh, what else? Trying to catch up. Okay, so <laughs> gameplay effects, they have this concept of, and I and I use this word because I have to explain it to people. Inhibited. You know what that word means? Not in this context, context of like Unreal, no. Okay, so inhibited basically means exists. Okay, and then there's active. There, there's really two states of a gameplay effect. They're either active. Or inhibited. Okay. Let me actually move these up here. Uh, gameplay effects. Exists in and the inactive. So they can also be inactive, but if they're active, um, modifiers are being applied, tags are being modified, etc. So active means they're actually being used, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the thing. Is uh, so that's bugging me. Uh, so like inhibited when it when it when you see inhibited, that means it's going to get added to the stack of GEs that are existing in the list so a ge can go from inhibited to active it can also go from uh active to 
inactive and now it's just inhibiting until the duration has ended or it's been removed like manually kind of thing okay mm -hmm. that makes sense yep yeah uh i just need to explain that because no one ever explains that and people get very confused by that so that's why uh so when i say you can remove ge's you basically you can add uh whoops that's the wrong one um where is it you can grant tags to the target actor which is you know the one who this is being applied to you can uh require tags that are on the target for this to apply slash continue you know like if it's periodic um oh yeah tags this effect has so this is how you label this ge with gameplay tags automatically so that way you can go like i want to remove all the gameplay effects that have this tag and then it will find them using this if it doesn't have this then it's not going to find them so uh this seems like you would want to use it but there's plenty of cases where you're just like i want to remove the class instead entirely i don't care about tags um and i'll show you that in a moment let me go to uh remove other effects actually what was yeah, immunity to other effects is another option. But you can add all these tags, and that's how you describe this gameplay effect. Tags wow. can be used to describe them, just generally. So, Does it make sense so far? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of this is like, a, it's a very elaborate uh, system of you to be able to modularize how, how effects interact with each other. Because I'm using a very simple <laughs> deep, like, buff and debuff system, basically. Right? Yeah. Uh, because my like the the one I'm using is very easy. It's like, yeah. you, are you adding a number? No. Yes or no? You know, are you adding a multiplier? Yeah. But obviously, this this is like, uh, yeah, if you have a bunch of very complicated system that is being influenced else by, by a lot of factor as well, then yeah, you need this to, to be able to let you also implement your logic to say filter out certain things. Yeah. And it, the thing about the, the gameplay effects that's really powerful is you can treat just the gameplay effect being inhibited or active as like, this is how many of like X amount to scale by kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So you're not actually modifying any values. You're just basically stacking up a bunch of these GEs onto a, a character. And then you're reading from it at runtime going, there's 15 of these GEs. That's all I need. Do this scaled by that you know that amount um which is a really powerful thing so then you can remove uh gameplay effects via many ways <laughs> on the owner if uh if mm -hmm. the owner has these tags if the effect which is the ge has these tags uh if the source spec tag remember remember <laughs> the the ge <laughs> source had it had to have stuff if that has tags you know um, so how do they determine the order? Is it just kind of going by that particular order? So it goes through an aggregate. Um, oh. The aggregate, yeah, it aggregates. So, yeah. Um, basically, when they get applied, they, they will run initially when they're applied, and then uh, anything that's periodic or over time, they will they will then evaluate it again. But it's pretty much, it's aggregated, and it is also the case of, like, um, first come first serve kind of thing okay yeah it, it's pretty simple to follow at that point um if they're modifying and again back to like if you're trying to filter for this uh for the rem removing of effects like what if it's modifying this attribute so any of them that are modifying a specific attribute uh the effect source again going back to that spec that was like who's the causer and stuff um, and you can also go just by definition, which is straight up the class and just remove them that way. So do that. Um, what else? You can do a custom, like, can you apply this effect? And it's basically just, uh, a class. And then there you go. Um, grant gameplay abilities. Uh, what else? Hi, Gatika. Um, 
you can also chain gameplay effects together so you could be like all right when your tag when your default attributes get set up or you can use like a wrapper as like okay, this is just the the wrapper for initializing the other GEs. So I don't have to open like my character blueprint and set it there. I can just open up this guy, set it here, and then move on to the next thing. Um, it's kind of like for usability and stuff. So, right. Uh, and UX as well as like just general organization. Um, so then you can do like, all right, I want to, when this is applied, which does not get applied periodically, uh, the components, this one doesn't get applied periodically for components pass. Uh, some other components do, but not this one. Um, and then you just specify the class of which GE you're going to use, and then you can have like, okay, the source needs to have these tags to be able to apply it. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I've done my own custom version of this, uh, where it's a little bit more like detailed and also requires like the source and target to have these tags, but it's like. All right, uh, that's about it, you know. Um, what else? Uh, gameplay cues. These are just, you know, magnitude attributes you can feed into it, and then the gameplay cue tag associated. So, um, min and max levels, that kind of thing. Additional, you can stack, so like, uh, Let's say the gameplay effect adds a gameplay cue tag to the player for like fire and they're on fire now Mm -hmm. and you stack it and there's five stacks of the GEs and as each DE runs out its duration, then when the final one is removed, that's when the gameplay effect gets removed because they're all stacked up in terms of the gameplay cue tag. So the gameplay cues can can stack. So, or gameplay tags can stack. In some cases, in other cases, they don't. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, stackable gameplay cues or gameplay tags would be really nice, but they don't expose that to Blueprint. <laughs> um, okay, I think that's generally it with the gameplay effects. As I said, this was like, this one is probably the most real important part. So I thought we'd get that out of the way. Yeah. All right. Uh, Usually in a gameplay effect, you'll have like one modifier or just doing like this where you're setting the defaults and then um, maybe one component or two, and that's about it. So it's not like you need it to be complicated. Um, but right, usually it's... That basically yeah. holds all the effects that happens, exactly right, in the game. So yeah. you just have to declare them. Yeah, and it's just it systematizes it all. An important aspect is these are actually classes. So I can go into here, oh, okay. blueprint class, uh, gameplay effects, and there you go. Okay. And then that's it. And here's a, it, it usually ends up being like, okay, I make it, I open it, and then I close it, and then you get the data view. <laughs> right. Because, yeah, yeah you, this is usually what people will do with it. Um, this is so we can add var- variables to them and use them for code or whatever. So, like, I want to get the gameplay effect definition, and then does it cast to this type? Then I can get these variables out of it, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But that kind of is solved with the component stuff. So you, it's kind of like, okay, I just inherit from a component and then just add to that. Problem solved. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Um, okay. So now I'm going to focus on blueprint or the gameplay effect, gameplay abilities. Uh, Because we covered attributes, I think. We covered gameplay effects. Uh, We covered the ability system component, gameplay abilities. So, gameplay abilities, uh, they operate on two two aspects. So, I'm going to do get ability system component. So, we give an ability. Okay. This is basically where you have to grant it so it can be activatable. All right. And it gives you this ability spec handle. All right. So remember that handle stuff? Yeah. Uh, Yeah. So this one, the spec handle is basically just an ID and it's handled across the network for you, which is nice. Um, So uh, activate, try and activate ability. 
Um, so that's actually what you would do with it, basically, is like, okay, I want to give it to kind of grant it so I can activate it. Usually I'll do this like either when the actor spawns and it's just kind of initializing and setting up, or I will do this like at runtime when I'm picking up things and then it's get, granting it so then I can activate it kind of thing. Um, you have to call this on the server because it basically is just a list of abilities that classes that replicate down to the client. So you have to wait for a frame for it to replicate, basically, uh, where the GEs are RPC-based in a way. So uh, for activating, they're also RPC-based, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, so then you can uh, try to activate the ability if the ability has been given <laughs> and it will let you know if it was successful or not. Yep. All right. Abilities are pretty simple. And you, uh, here we go again with the level and you can also tie, bind it to an input if you want to. But again, yeah, the real important meat is just the class. So abilities can have three different types of instancing. They can be not instance, which is that class default object that we talked about. Uh, it can be per actor, which is really per ability system component. Okay. And then there's per execution, which is basically like instance every time when you try, when you get activated. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, for networking stuff, like, you know, uh, by default, they do not replicate. That's actually what I would suggest because that's going to be more performant and faster for your network than if you replicated it. And I really don't recommend trying to replicate these because, like, that's just a bunch of extra network stuff that you have to manage rather than do it the correct way with gas. Um, replicate input directly, and that, that's still networking stuff. Again, tying it to that input binding that you're doing. Yep. Um, what else? Uh, execution policies. These are just client or server, as it can predict. Uh, okay, so retrigger instanced ability. So, as a heads up, uh, you can retrigger it if it's instance per actor kind of thing. So it'll basically call end ability, and then it will, uh, and it will not tell you if it was canceled or not. It just says it was ended, and then uh, you have to basically handle and resolve that for like what happens when this ability ends. Um, you can also have triggers tied to it. So like if I want to instead use a gameplay tag as a gameplay event. So a gameplay event, I'm writing another thing down now. Gameplay event is a non-stored event. So it's not save state or anything. It's just an event that gets sent out. You know, it's like a delegate basically. Okay using a tag and event data. Okay. Via target data. Okay. So you can input additional data into this event data using target data. Try saying that three times fast. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, yeah. Yeah, remember all those contexts concepts thing i was talking about welcome to welcome to gas uh i know it's a lot but it really once you start moving and grooving with it it's like you can do whatever you want it's really powerful um it's a fantastic base to use uh and the people that don't like it just don't like how how large it is but it's like once mm. you've worked on these kind of stuff like you know how much it's needed um because then you end up building it yourself anyway in those simple cases. So you can you can basically have this ability trigger, which is based which is actually activate um, based on a gameplay event, or an own tag was added to the ability system component, or the tag is present currently on the ability system component. Um, if the tag is removed, then the ability you know the ability is also told to cancel or end, whereas own tag is just like the when it gets added do this and that's it mm -hmm. whereas gameplay event is just an event that gets broadcast in a way and i'll show you what that looks like here so gameplay event send gameplay event to actor and you basically just feed in the actor 
and it will find the ability system component. You can give it a tag, and then you give it a payload. So this payload is this, the struct. So you can feed in event tags. So okay. the event tag is what it's going to look for here with trigger tag. So the tag to respond to. Yeah, see? Right. Then you have instigator data. You can feed in target data, optional objects, so forth, context handles, <laughs> uh, tag, instigator tags, target tags, magnitude again, if you want to feed in that. And then there's target data. Target data is where, again, I was specifying, you can feed in that extra stuff that you can override and you know polymorphically add extra stuff to. Does that make sense? Yeah, like, holy crap, this is really deep. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, and I you mean, can even do that with the context. Needed. It's needed, handle. yeah, because you, yeah. you're building a generic system of um, yep. a bunch of variables <laughs> working with each other. Yep. And I've straight up built my own version of this gameplay event stuff in C++ on previous projects where it doesn't even use the tag. It just directly calls to it and feeds in all this context data for it. Um, but the tag is required, so there does need to be a tag for it. I see. But if you just, huh? Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, but if you if it it and it's a weird thing of like, you could honestly just set the tag here, and I think it sets it here as well, um, to save time. But this tag does need to be set, uh, and I've done that where I've just overrided it, so I don't need to use the tag at all or or modify this. I can just have it coded into the class. Um, but you can only do that in C++, and it takes a little bit of work. Um, you could also just specify, like, a generic, like, uh, event, you know, activate uh, this type of ability, and then that's it, you know, or primary ability one. But even then, it's kind of like that. That's really not fun, because then you got to hard code it into the class of the ability. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah. So this one I don't really recommend using in, for most a lot of cases. I mean, unless you know what you're doing or you know it's only going to be applying because of this context. So, because if you're doing primary ability, it's like, what if this is not the primary ability? What if it's secondary or something? Well, right, then it's going to you know, really have a lot of bad chain reaction. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like you, you end up doing the uh, try and activate a lot more. And it's like you lose out on being able to feed in event data. So, yeah. Just a note for anyone wondering. Um, what else? Uh, I mean, you could just specify the tag specifically for this type and be like sprint tag kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Event.sprint or whatever. But that's actually what the input stuff is generally for as well not the replicate input but uh input id or whatever or you can just do try and activate but yeah again you'd lose that on the event data stuff uh which is really powerful um otherwise you would have to manually get it from the character after it's activated so i kind of wish they had a version that was like feed in event data when you activate it and then it's like great i can feed in that stuff but yeah um okay what else let's see uh activate on granted yeah this is all just from the project so like they have some extra stuff for when it gets granted just activate it automatically so now we're going to look at the actual blueprint so oh yeah there's also a cost thing so it's it's linking up a mm -hmm. gameplay effect to apply in this blueprint for automation purposes Mm -hmm. um, the only events that are being overridden here are activate and end. So we're going to follow that path. So I press shift on my keyboard uh, and it, the game decides, all right, we're going to sprint, you know, activate the sprint ability. So there's two actual activates. Activate ability, events, activate ability from event, and activate ability. All right. Depending on which route it's coming in, this one only activates from the events. This one only activates generically. Okay. Yeah. So. All right. So, uh, activate ability 
we're telling, we're tracking, okay, we're ending sprint. Um, apply the gameplay effect to owner, which is this class right here. Uh, standard sprint. You can open that guy up. And all he does is just grant tags. State sprinting to the actor, hero character. Okay. And we're giving an ability level, which is some already set up stuff. That would be the case of like, just go through the list and see what's available to you. They give you a lot of stuff, which is really nice. Oh, that reminds me also. So, uh, event data. This is useless. Don't use this. Wait, what? They have this variable for abilities, event data, from the activate ability um, from event, but they never set it. <laughs> Right? <laughs> Wait, so like it, it, it could trigger an event but nothing's coming through? No, this will this will feed it through. Oh okay. This one just gives you nothing. Oh what the fuck? It's meant to be this. So event data. You can only get it too, you can't set it. Oh that's that's dumb. <laughs> I just wanted to let you know about that. Don't that's use dumb. this because you have to override it in C to then set it. I found out, and it was really stupid. I was like, are you kidding me? They couldn't set that up? What happened? It just sits there. It's literally just sitting there. Taking up memory. Going to get cold. <laughs> yep. So anyway, back to... I'm done with my rant. Um, right, so yeah, wait. they save out a handle for the sprint gameplay effect, because it's right now just adding the tag. And it's set to an infinite duration, so... That means the ability is going to tell it to remove it, not from uh, automated ways. Uh, then we're going to add a gameplay cue to the owner, which is telling the hero sprint, uh, remove on ability end. So when you use that one, it basically is being tracked by the ability. So it knows which gameplay cue tags to remove kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. And context apparently is optional, so you don't have to worry about that. So whenever you see a context tag or, or pin or something, compile and see if you're fine with not having to plug in stuff. <laughs> so, all right. So actor info. Um, yeah, so actor info gets owner. Nope. So I guess, yeah. There have been times where I've just made functions for these because uh, these are, you know, just objects. So you can just inherit from it and then, you know, make them abstract and then specify a bunch of utility functions um but basically what this guy brings you is the owner actor the avatar the player controller from the owner if it finds it you can also write in c plus plus to set it directly if needed the ability system component which is the owner the skeletal mesh component that was found on either the owner or the avatar the anim instance that's found from this guy and the movement component found on the avatar. Oh, oh wow! So you all these are on the avatar. Sorry. Just use it to trigger a lot of reactions and just play exactly. With as well. Exactly. So you can get this stuff really easily. That's what the actor info is for. This is already set up for you. It's all valid except for like, you know, if there's no component, if there's no player controller, like it's on an AI or something like that, and it specifically is player controller, so you can't do AI controller, which is dumb. So you would have to do avatar uh, is AI um, um, AI controlled. Yeah, get AI controller, and then is it valid from there kind of thing. But the avatar, the owner, and the ability system component will always be valid. You don't need to check those. Make sense? Yeah. All right. Movement component will also always be valid if you know this is only going to be used on a player or something like that. Like, or a if you if you know this ability is only going to be used on a player or something like that, you're you don't have to valid check most of this probably, because you'll be like, I already know this is not going to be valid, or I know it's going to be valid. If it's not valid, that's a big problem that something broke earlier in the code. Mm -hmm. All right, because this guy finds it when this guy activates. This is actually pretty. This is more efficient than than to say you write your own query. Exactly. Because right? it's done in the on the back end, right? So. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So some of these can be valid, can be null. It often it will tell you to often null. Uh, shouldn't be null. 
this will often be null if it's an AI. Mm -hmm. um, this will often be null if you know there's no avatar because you can actually leave the avatar as null. The owner right. should not be null. Well, I mean, like, like I would, yeah. as as a dev, like, I would not even expose like users to this. I would just write a bunch of wrappers, right? Exactly. Them, you would just make functions themselves. for getting yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it, that's what I usually do too. Yeah. It's anyway. Come from this. Yeah. So anyway, they uh they basically in this one they then tell the movement components they're doing gameplay stuff now, that's actually in the world is yeah. uh tell the movement components start sprinting. Then. They do a thing with uh, releasing waiting for input stuff. So the waiting for input stuff is basically like um, that's tied to the input ID stuff that you have to set up in C++. Mm -hmm. Just be aware of that. So this will not work unless you've set it up in C++, which is really dumb in my opinion, but be aware of that. You can honestly get around it with instead gameplay tags. And just add and remove gameplay tags based on input, and then <laughs> it's listening oh, for that. Oh, yeah. Wow. So, Wait, do you think that takes better? I I think the gameplay tag route is better and more agnostic. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you don't need to use C++, which that's, is great. It's abusing the system really hard, to be honest. No, that's not abusing it. That's <laughs> by design. <laughs> by design, I'm doing it. Uh, Oh yeah, also abilities can have tags applied to them. So this ability has the ability.sprint tag. Yep. Um, you can cancel the ability with this tag. So there you go, there's another route. Uh, activation own tags. So this is applied to the owner when this guy activates. You know, that kind of stuff. Block tags. So this ability won't activate if it's blocked by these tags. Like you're dead, you're stunned, or you don't have the skill. Right. Or you do have that skill active kind of thing or whatever. So anyway, uh, they start the wait for input stuff. This will happen immediately afterwards because it's like there. It's just a you know this then this then this kind of thing. Anything under that is going to be like okay dependent on release or something like that. Otherwise, it'll just sit there. So after we start waiting for the input to release, so I'm letting go of like the shift button or something. I'm going to start a wait delay, and they're just looping around, basically. Now, this is for networking purposes, where they're doing some net sync stuff. All right, so... Uh, yeah, so the prediction key... The prediction key stuff is just for networking purposes, where you're given a, a prediction key that handles hierarchically activating abilities. And the key is uniquely generated uh, from the client, to send to the server and be like, hey, this is what I'm predicting. The server will then verify it and send it back saying it's confirmed or it's rejected. If the key is rejected, it kills the whole chain of dependencies that it's connected to. If it's approved, moves on to the next key and tells it, hey, I got approved. You Did you get approved? That kind of thing. Okay. Um, so it's it's very lightweight and simple and good. But when the, the key will become invalid after it's been confirmed or rejected either way basically because it's no longer the one that the ability system is using right because it's like it already got it already went to the path of you know confirmation and stuff yeah. so what it's they're doing like... here is when you use the wait, wait net sync uh task it creates a new sp like prediction key so that's what they're basically doing it's like okay wait for the server to gen give us a new prediction key because you can also get them from the server and then once that's happened only charge stamina when moving accelerating on the ground. So this is more of... Okay. So they're getting the movement component again. They're getting the acceleration. They're checking yeah, to make sure... like To set the speed of your character. Yeah. Uh, you, they expose it here, but obviously you could also use the interface to call to the character just to set it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, at, 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 the, at this point, when it gets down to this part of the logic yeah it's like oh th these things happen and it's replication yep. safe right so it's you, you're getting the correct response so it's just really downstream back to how you want to do with the signal yeah exactly yeah. so like at this point like you would you would just have this gate here essentially and then going okay uh you know uh what is the commit so 
This commit ability cost is basically this guy. It's it's just a shorthand thing. There are people that say you have to do this. That is not true. 100% that is not true. This is completely optional. Okay. I want that to be clear. Because there's people that are spreading incorrect information about this. But like, so does that not like? Hmm? Does well, so when the when the ability hits, it already factors in like the cost already. No, no, no. So ability. There are people that are saying that you have to commit ability costs whenever you do anything with abilities for replication. And oh, I well, am telling you, it it actually just runs this. It just applies this GE to itself. That's all it's doing. It's it's basically this. Oh, so if you don't have it set up to kind of, kind of like commit to something, yeah, like it it's really just a, wouldn't it's, trigger anyways. It, it, yeah, it's just a shorthand. That's all it is. Oh, okay. It is uh, not it's required. Nice. It, yeah, it's nice to set up in like an effect. Oh, no, online, yeah. Right? yeah. I'm just saying like there's, there's people that are saying it online and I have to clarify and tell you like that is not true. Okay. I see. It is not required at all. I've thoroughly stepped through the code i have gone through many times not oh, using oh so they thought they thought if they don't commit it, it wouldn't count like the ability yeah. wouldn't execute yep that's crazy <laughs> yeah. you already got a confirmation from the server what do you want <laughs> like <laughs> yeah and that happens like for activation like you you don't have to worry uh, okay. about this I so see. it's like the commit the commit's different the commit what happens is just applying the ge that's literally what the function does i can even go into the code and point it to you and show it to you but it, just one yeah, yeah. It, we already saw it in blueprints you're not seeing anything special um you can also broadcast the commit event so like if someone is listening to this gameplay effect saying tell me when they commit their ability cost or whatever right um yeah so yeah so let's so you know uh are we moving? Yes. Are we not falling? Yes. All right. Well, let's apply the sprint cost, which is basically just lower the sprint by one. You know, just keep subtracting sprint from it. Keep subtracting sprint. That's all it's doing. Nothing and, else. And you, you really don't have to worry about uh, the attribute not being there because you declared it in C++. So exactly yeah it's always yeah you have to basically do the hard work of figuring out what you really want and then writing it there yeah and then there so the instant one is basically just instantly do the change and then that's it do the change and that's it right so um yeah okay and so as you might have thought Remember, there's base and then there's current. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <coughs> so that instant will modify the base. Oh, okay. Yeah, because it's you know it's not a set duration of time, so it's like it's not adding and removing; it's just immediately applying, immediately applying. Mm -hmm. So you have to be aware of that. I wish there was a way of just saying current but it doesn't make sense if it was current because it's like current is based on other ge's whereas this is not based off of other g's this is based off current value right. or the the actual base value because it's going to be instantaneously applied and then removed right does that make sense yeah yep yeah because it's like yeah it's something that it, it's gotten many people as like a foot gun situation, so just be aware. Uh, okay, and then did it apply successfully? Yes. Okay. Uh, what? Okay. Uh, oh yeah, current acceleration. Yeah, and I think they're reading from the attribute at the in the character movement, so they're going if the. You know, if the attribute stamina is still greater than zero, you know, keep sprinting. Otherwise, don't kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Or if they stop sprinting. Actually, let me test this. Um, let's test this. Shoot, 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 shoot. I'm just holding sprint, by the way. Yeah. So I think they're, they have something else that's listening or something like that. You know, like remove the sprint tag. Uh, actually, let's see. Yeah, it's probably just removing the sprint tag. Um, in which case, when the input is released, 
and sprint or you know doing this this is not really that safe actually it is it's, yeah it's fine end the sprint just for this ability to know the state of it and then end the ability mm -hmm. i want to call this out so there's end ability locally end ability state <laughs> end ability ability task um let me just connect these back up oh state yeah states are synced uh, uh across clients yeah right uh one second cancel one day i'll learn the type task cancel set can be canceled yeah that's new um okay so so we have uh so we have all these other options too. So end ability, this deals with replication. So if it's called on the client or server, it will follow this replication policy stuff. Mm -hmm. um, if you call end locally, uh, then it's going to locally end this ability, but it will not do any replication stuff. Okay. End task. Uh, this is for... Um, these guys so wait task wait input release that kind of thing because they have different they actually have task names on them so then you can end the task based on that um let me actually even type in ask uh yeah wait for attribute change that kind of thing honestly i never use those ta that node <laughs> so um so this one I, I never use it really uh this one i do use for networking End ability state, so you can actually do uh, state for abilities. I think that's it. No. Um, let me actually just open this guy up. Uh, commit, check costs. Oh, yeah, this is like you can check to see if you can apply cooldowns, commits, that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. Is locally. You can also have it block other abilities and being like, this is the only one exclusively. Um, let's see. State. Yeah, you can start an ability state. So this is also a task where it's like, okay, uh, run this code, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And then you can actually be like, end, I think, yeah, end task. And that will be like okay the task is now ended kind of thing and mm -hmm. state ends so this is much more of like if you want to modularize this out in functions and stuff like that in the graph to clean it up a bit um forget like no it's going to place in the bad graph i'm trying to remember if they handled the replication for you i think they do um i think they might be local actually but uh, that's something to play with. Um, but yeah, again, this would actually be the good case of using this guy, end task by instant name, and then you use that as like the name. Uh, set can be canceled if you can call a cancel ability, uh, cancel task by instant name, same thing. Um, interrupted is basically canceled. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you used cancel ability instead, when you call end ability, it will tell you if it was canceled or not. That's basically what it was. Okay. And then when it so in this case when it's ending, we're telling it remove this, you know, gameplay effect if applicable. Um, if it isn't already removed, kind of thing. If it is, nothing happens. You know, nothing blows up. We're fine. Um, how many stacks to remove? If you leave it negative, we'll remove all of the stacks. Otherwise, you know, how many you want to remove? That kind of thing. It's up to you. Uh, then we have the movement component tell it sp stop sprinting and we're done holy crap they really opened it up yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i mean that's a that's a really like so yeah because I, I, I was just waiting like man do i just write my own shit where it's like <laughs> here's my own ability object here's where you know the when it gets created, here's where this, you know, parent and subscriber, listener, whatever, 
and then it just drives the whole thing. I was just like, oh my god, do I really gotta write this shit myself? Yep. <laughs> Turns out they already did it for you with gas. It's nice. It's nice. The, but the ramp up for this though, it takes. Cause yeah. I'm looking at it like, cause I'm I'm, I'm making a very so simple, much. I'm just making a very <laughs> simple game where you have a few stats to play with. So yeah. It's it's really neat though, cause like um, for a lot a lot of the concept like things like grants, right? Like, did 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 you actually get it, or is do I just actually gonna give it to you without any cost, right? Like those kind of concept. I I was just, like writing some of those myself. I was like, yeah, like dude, <laughs> this is <Yeah>. dumb. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, they Neat. they did all that. I'm gonna hmm? do some more reading into this. Okay. Yeah, cause like um, I I love this cause well obviously like the the hard work for all of this is the is replication right the, the fact that it that they they got it done. Well, not even just replication; it's modular too with like yeah the abilities and stuff. Uh oh, we haven't even covered gameplay cues. Do you want to look at that or yeah, not? sure, yeah, yeah. If you all can right. show me. All right, so first let me go to here, Tools, Gameplay Queue Editor. So they have a whole editor where you can see which tags are tied to an actor or handler. If there isn't one, then you can add a new one. Uh, otherwise, we can open it up. So we're going to open up uh, GC Sprint. Okay. And you can add a new Gameplay Queue tag here, and you can specify which source INI folder has it, or file has it. And you can even filter, you can search for them. They've, they've kind of improved it lately. Uh, so it's straight. So in this case, it's a gameplay queue notify actor. Uh, so uh, straight up just an actor, as you can tell. Um, there is nothing in the scene. All right. And the construction script is the same thing. You can't really throw gameplay cues in the level. So don't try to do that. Uh, so there. In this case, uh, it is listening for the gameplay cue hero sprint tag. So, uh, is it this guy? No. Uh, is this guy? There he is. See? Gameplay cue hero sprint. Yep. So, that's what it's tied to. And you can set it as an override. Uh, that way you can, like, test different things. You know? So you're like, I want to make a new one and not break our game and stuff so i'm just going to do this override and that's for like me personally if there's two that are overriding it will complain and tell you like hey it's fighting with this other guy so uh unique instance per instigator unique instance per source object this is just like um instancing pooling kind of related stuff uh allow multiple of on active events in case you want to add and remove multiple times kind of thing um, or stack them how many to pre-allocate uh, how many multiple while well, active events um, all right one sec cat all right um, this one the, honestly the gameplay cues are pretty self-explanatory they're just kind of simple but um okay so we're gonna look at the functions so we have a few for handle. This is a generic like event, okay, gameplay event. Uh, this is an on active, so initially activated. Execute, um, as it says, instant gameplay effects or periodic ones. And in this case, they're doing while active. So this is like right after the first on active is called. Uh, yeah, <laughs> while it's active, kind of thing. Yeah, so it passes in the target, which is the actor. Okay, we go back to this guy. It's talking about ourself, so that's the target. Um, or the gameplay ability is really pointing to the ability system component, which is pointing to the I think avatar maybe. Uh. Yeah, it's it, it's giving you the avatar. So uh, we're getting the avatar's mesh and spawning a emitter, feeding in the speed VFX, you know, speed buff, where to attach, location, all that sort of fun things. Spawn another one at the other foot, and then that's about it. And 
the return value really doesn't matter. It's just so that way they, they can actually do stuff. Um, and then on remove, same case. I mean, while active, you can enable it if you want, but mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. Um, and then when it gets removed, remove the component kind of thing. Yep. And it's specifically built this way. So we can actually look at a different one. Um, your target actor X maybe? Oh, jeez. All right. All right. Uh, let's go to tools, gameplay queue editor, fire gun impacts. Let's try that one. Yeah. So this one, this one is a gameplay queue static. This is the one where it's like a single instance in the entire level is basically executing this. So it does not hold state. Okay. And here it's basically going like, all right, get the parameters, get you know the hit result data, and spawn the emitter, which is this assault rifle hit particle effect yep. at that location. And here's the world context, which is the actor. And then uh, that's about it. And that's the tag and the override. So yeah, pretty straightforward. Just like things that's happening downstream. Yeah, exactly. You know, not really affecting gameplay. Very small, right. simple stuff. Yeah. So yeah. Okay, pretty pretty nice. I mean, like it, it really just does exactly kind of what I expected it to do. You know, keep track of things in a in a more modular and complicated, customizable way. Yep. And you also can apply gameplay effects and stuff outside of abilities, by the way. So you can do it, like, in this actor and oh, stuff. But... Oh, you could literally tell it. Yeah, you just oh. need an ability system component. That's all you need. So, yeah, apply ability oh, system right, component right, itself. Right, okay. Yeah, 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 okay. That's about it. Okay. And then, like, you can make the spec handle. Uh, where, where are they making the spec handle? Let me find you. Um, are they... They might actually be feeding it in. Let me let me find it. Last member. Let's drag this over. Where where are they getting this? Uh maybe here. Here, let's let's do this. Reference viewer. Yeah, this is a more complicated guy, so uh, this spawns that meteor, so owning, so that modifies the camera, weight target data. Oh, oh, so yeah, this is using the target data actor, um, so I guess the meteor is a projectile that inherits from that. Um, yep, there it is. So, in that case, is it getting its... Let me see. Data. I'm trying to find where is it getting that <laughs> that that class uh, or that handle. Unless stun spec handle. Damn it. So this one's clearly coming from this guy, but. Stun effect spec handle. Where are you coming from? Expose on spawn. Okay, let's go back. Sorry. Uh, oh, that's the spawn info. Nope. Oh, the stun effect. Oh, here it is. Spawning the actor. I'm being dumb. Okay. So yeah, it's just spawning the actor normally and then feeding this data in. Yep. Make on outgoing, yeah. So then this guy. Yeah. Yeah, this is just the decal that gets placed on the ground. So, for targeting. Yeah, pretty much does not really need any logic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Then, nice. And then they just wait for it, so.
Oh man, like this is this is great. This is really really great. If I want to make a fucking multiplayer game, oh, <laughs> this is sweet. Or move your game to multiplayer. Yeah, no, it's gonna be a single player. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna pause the recording. We're exactly at two hours mark. This is great. Oh wow, nice. Yeah.